Well, good evening. It's so great to be here with all of you on this freezing January day. Teaching the Word of God is one of my favorite things to do. Um, this is like, this is what I look forward to all year long, just teaching the Word of God. So I'm just so honored to be able to do that with you tonight. Another place that I have the opportunity to do that is at um, a small Christian school, and I get to come and do chapel at that school. And so I went this November to, do, to, to speak at chapel, and they have this overarching theme for the whole year, and it's called God's Story Sets Hearts Free. So that's the theme, God's Story Sets Hearts Free, and then every month there's a topic that goes with that. So I got to teach on the image of God and how that sets our hearts free. I'm like, oh, this is so great. So I go there, and these are kindergarten through fifth grade. And I'm like, okay, so who can tell me what the theme is? And like everyone is like, me, 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 you know, they're all like, pick me, pick me. So I'm like, okay, what's the theme? And this little girl's like, God is love. And I'm like, yes, God is love. Okay, but does anyone know what the theme is? And then this other, you know, little boy's like, Holy Spirit. And I'm like, well, yes, yes, Holy Spirit. And then Trinity. And, the, you know, and they all are like raising their hands and nobody knows what the theme is. I'm like, teachers, come on. But nobody knows that the theme is God's story sets our hearts free. So they didn't know the theme. And I think in a lot of ways, we're kind of like those kindergarten through fifth graders. We know God is love, and we know we're supposed to follow Jesus. But we don't always know and believe that God's story sets our hearts free, or what the story is, or how it sets our hearts free. So what I want you to walk away from tonight don't be like the kindergartners. From tonight, I want you to know the truth of the kingdom of God sets our hearts free. And what we're going to do throughout these next nine weeks is we're going to develop what is the truth of the kingdom of God and how does that set our hearts free. See, we live out the stories that we believe. How we act, think, behave, it's based on what we believe. And we cannot believe something that we don't know. So we want to know the story of the Bible and the story of God's kingdom so that we can live it out and how we live. See, there's, there's a lot of stories in the Bible. There's a lot of stories. A lot of us know a lot of them. But it's actually one big story. So I brought my son's Bible. It says one big story. I love that. One big story because it's telling one big overarching story. And that story really is the kingdom of God and how God in Christ is redeeming and restoring and making all things new. Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. It was, it was the primary thing that he prayed for. It was the center of his prayer life. He mentioned, or it was mentioned, 126 times in the gospel. So it's a pretty, pretty big deal. And my question is, do we know this story, the story of the kingdom of God and how God in Christ is making all things new? And do we know how every story in this book points to that overarching story of Christ making all things new? And that's what this study is about we want to understand the kingdom of God. We want to understand as it was in Eden. We want to understand the kingdom of God as it develops throughout Scripture. We want to see what it was like when Jesus came. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. And what did that mean? And then how we live in this already but not yet kingdom. We're going to greater dive into that. And then we want to understand and fall in love with what is going to happen when Jesus returns and his kingdom is established here on the earth. And understanding this truth, it's going to give us boldness. It's going to give us confidence. It's going to give us just a greater love for God, a desire to follow him in, in every area of our lives and to surrender to him. It's going to give us a greater understanding of our Bibles. We're going to read Isaiah and Habakkuk, and it's going to make more sense because we're able to understand how it all fits together into the story of the kingdom of God. So as we begin our study of Genesis 1 through 3, I want to share this quote. It's from Andy Crouch. And he says, 
I've concluded there are four chapters missing from the working Bibles of all too many Christians. And these missing chapters are not some obscure ceremonial text or dusty corners of the Royal Chronicles. Instead, they are the very bookends of Scripture. The first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation. And to miss these chapters, the first two about creation and the second two about new creation, is to miss the whole point of the biblical story. And when these chapters drop out of our functional Bibles, our understanding of culture, power, salvation itself is badly weakened. See, I grew up in Sunday school. I attended Christian education from preschool to 12th grade. And I can tell you that this quote was true of me until quite recently. So if you feel like it's true of you, you're in the right place. See, I, I could quote from Scripture, from memory of the Scriptures, Genesis 1 and 2, and I knew we were created in the image of God, and what day God made the vegetation, you know, I probably mapped it all out in school, and what day he made man and the animals, and, and all that. I, I knew all that. I knew that. But I didn't understand that these Scriptures represented God's kingdom, I didn't understand that the Garden of Eden was the first temple where God's presence was. I didn't understand that Adam and Eve were the first priests and kings, and they were to reign and rule under God as servant kings and to bring God's presence to all the world. I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand that. I certainly didn't understand new creation or the fact that I'm living in this already not yet kingdom of God or what it would be like when Jesus returned. I thought the goal was getting to heaven. But see, nowhere in the New Testament does any author suggest that heaven is the Christian goal. Jesus prayed that God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And the New Testament ends with the new Jerusalem coming down this earth in new creation. It doesn't end with souls going up. It ends with God coming down and establishing his kingdom forever. The goal is new creation. That's the goal, the new creation. And what we're going to see, because we're in the already not yet kingdom, and I'm going to get into those definitions here in a little bit, but we're in the already not yet kingdom, is that new creation is actually happening in us. It's happening. It started in us. And see, when I started to grasp all of that, whew, Scripture came alive to me. Whew, my purpose became so clear. Love for God, just, oh, Lord, you're so good. You're so big. Just, oh, you're amazing. When trials came, it's, it's light. It's momentary. I just want to follow you, Jesus. Just surrendering to him. Oh, just understanding the kingdom. It just blew my mind. Insecurity, hopelessness. It just disappeared. So that's what we get to dig into this session. We're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And as we study Genesis 1 through 3, we're going to see connections to Revelation 21 and 22. So today, what I'm going to do is give an overview of the kingdom of God, address some key themes that we're going to develop throughout the study, and then next week, we're digging into Genesis, and the homework will be digging into Genesis, and we're going to talk a lot about the purpose of the book of Genesis and authorship and original audience and all of that. So if we're talking about the kingdom of God, why are we starting with Genesis? It's probably the big question. In the first three chapters, we see where we begin. We see what our purpose is. We see what the problem is with the world. We see the problem. And we see the solution all in the first three chapters. So we're going to trace themes of the presence of God throughout all of Scripture we're going to trace the themes of our purpose, living waters. And we're going to see that the kingdom of God began in Genesis 1. And we get to trace that throughout all of Scripture. So what's the story of the kingdom? It's not in the Old Testament. It's not in the Old Testament. So 
why did we name this the kingdom, right? If we're looking at Genesis 1 through 3, why is it named the kingdom? Because even though the term is not used in Genesis, we're going to see that it very much is in Genesis. We'll see that the kingdom of God first began in the Garden of Eden. So what I want you to do is turn to the back of your study books, and I have a definitions page for you. It's on page 168, right there. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time going over these definitions. So first we have kingdom of God. And we define that as God's reign through God's people over God's appointed place. And we first see that in the Garden of Eden. We have Adam and Eve who live in obedience to the rule and reign of God. But then we see in Genesis 3 that the kingdom of God is destroyed by the sin of man. And the rest of the Bible is about the restoration of humanity to be willing subjects of the perfect rule of God. So when you think kingdom, think God's people under God's rule. And throughout the Bible, God is re-establishing his kingdom. And now in our day, the kingdom goes out as the gospel spreads and as people bow to the king. So we have three terms here that are going to help us understand the kingdom in the Bible. And I want you to know that as I go through this, if you're like, this is a little confusing, that, that's okay. We're going to be developing these. We're going to be developing throughout the rest of the study. So this is an introduction, and all of these are going to be developed in a much greater way throughout our study. So our first term is dwelling. So we define that as God's presence with humanity in the world that he created. His presence with humanity in the world that he created. I've heard it said that all of scripture can be summed up, God with us. God with us. God was with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And then God with the Israelites in the tabernacle, God's presence with them. And then the Israelites in, in um, the temple, he was, his presence was with them. And then Jesus came to this earth in the flesh, God with us. And then in Acts 2, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and God is with us. We are created to be with God. He made us for his presence. That's part of the kingdom, that God dwells with his people. But sin fractures and it breaks the dwelling that we have with God. That's the story of the Bible. We see that in Genesis 3. Sin breaks that dwelling that we have with God, but then God chooses to pursue us and reestablish his kingdom. Habakkuk 1.13, he writes, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. God is so perfect and so holy that he cannot even look on evil. But yet, if we were continue to look at that, we see that he does look on evil and he does tolerate wrongdoing because he's so good and he's so loving. He chooses to still pursue us. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and break the power of sin. He broke the power of sin so that we could dwell forever with God. And he says, you're holy, you're perfect, you're righteous, you're pure, even when we're not. That's what God did for us, God with us. He wants to dwell with us, even though he doesn't need to. He's perfectly content without us, right? But he's so loving and so perfect that he desires to dwell with us. Because he knows there is nothing in this world that can satisfy us but him. He created us for him. Psalm 1611 says, You will make known to me the way of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
See, one day we get to be in the fullness of that presence. When the kingdom is fully established, we will be in the fullness of his presence. And right now we're in that already, but not yet. Jesus has come. He's broken the power of sin. We get to be in the presence of God, but it's still not fully what it will one day be. And yet we still do get to experience it and we get to have the joy of him. See, knowing that we are created for the presence of God, it sets us free. It sets us free. It gives us peace when we feel alone, knowing that God never leaves us. It helps us reject the temptations and the ways of this world because we know that's not what we're created for and that will not give us fullness of joy. See, you... You may not feel this. I didn't feel this for a really long time. Like I would hear, I'm created for God's presence. He created me for him. But I'd be like, you know, I'm getting a lot of satisfaction in my job. I'm getting a lot of satisfaction in, you know, doing ministry or whatever. But eventually, we all know it falls short and it does not satisfy It does not satisfy. And see, for so long, I try to find worth and value and approval in what what people thought of me. I try to find it in doing doing this because I love doing ministry and and sharing the word of God. So I try to, you know, find it in that. For a short time, I tried to find it in the performance of my kids. That did not last long. They quickly failed me in that area. We will not find it in our children, will we? No, no. We will only find fullness, joy, fulfillment in Christ. We are created for him and that sets us free. Because when I feel like I have failed for the millionth time, because I fail again and again and again and go to other things, even knowing that I'm created for his kingdom, I'm created to dwell with him, I will satisfy for lesser things. I will will just settle for this and I'm created for him. I'm created for him, but I settle down here. But even when we settle, even when we mess up again and again, God lifts us up and he says, child, this is not who you are. This is not what you're created for. I have created you to be with me. I've created you to find your fulfillment in me. And he continues to pursue us. God with us. God with us. And in the fullness of the kingdom, that is all we're going to want to do is be in his presence and glorify his name. And that's where true freedom is found, doing what we ought to do. That's true freedom. But until that day, we can continue to pursue him, knowing that he lifts us up every single time we fall down. I love this hymn, living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. This sets our hearts free. We are created for the king. He is what satisfies us. And knowing that we're created to dwell with him brings us to our next kingdom theme, which is dominion. So dominion, we defined this as God's creation of the world and his command to humanity to extend his glory to all of creation. So dominion relates to the place. So we're going to see it, Eden, earth, kingdom. We're going to see that throughout our study. And then the task, which is discipleship of God's people. So God has given us dominion. We have dominion in the kingdom, and we are to use this dominion to extend his glory to all of creation. And we're going to see in the weeks to come that Adam and Eve, they were given dominion, and they were told to go and fill the earth, subdue it and fill it, and they were to extend God's glory to the ends of the earth. And we're going to see that, that rather than reign and rule under God, they were supposed to be servant kings reigning and ruling, that they chose to rival him. They wanted to be like God. They, they wanted to be like God. But God continued to pursue them. He continued to go after them. 
God does not reject us even though we reject him. He doesn't reject us. As I said, the story of the Bible is God reestablishing his kingdom here on the earth. See, God told Adam and Eve they were supposed to bring chaos or order to the chaos and light to the darkness. Just as God, when he spoke, he brought order to chaos and light to darkness. That was Adam and Eve's commission. And now it is our commission. It is our purpose to bring order to chaos and light to darkness. See, we are living temples because God is with us, because the Holy Spirit came and dwells within us. We carry the presence of God within us. And we extend his glory by bringing order to chaos, by bringing light to darkness by living for the king. We extend his glory by yielding allegiance to Jesus. We are to bring kingdom life to the ends of the earth. That's our purpose. And how do we do that? We do it by living in allegiance to the king. See, our purpose our purpose is found in obedience to the king. That's how we bring dominion. That's our purpose. See, I don't have to take a bunch of personality tests, and I, I like those, they're fun, but I don't have to take a bunch of personality tests and a bunch of quizzes to figure out what I'm supposed to do with my life. All I'm supposed to do is be obedient to the king. And as I'm obedient to the king, as I'm just following his path and listening to him and obeying him, he's going to show me where I have to go. He's going to show me how to take dominion and what I'm supposed to do in all these different areas. He's going to show us. See, God, he wants to reign and rule through human beings. I don't know why, because we're a bunch of messed up people. But he wants to reign and rule through us because it brings us so much joy. And that's our purpose. When he reigns and rules through us, then we can go and we can bring light to darkness and we can bring order to chaos. And when we do that, we find that we're living in our purpose and we're fulfilled. We're fulfilled and we're doing what God has called us to do. We find our place as we worship and honor the king. That is how we find our place, and that sets our hearts free. It sets our hearts free because we don't have to go look for purpose and identity. All we have to do is receive it. We just receive the identity. We don't have to achieve. We don't have to achieve anything. We just receive the identity that God has given us. See, the whole world is, is a mess right? We're, we're not denying that. The world's a big old mess right now. We're constantly asking, what's my purpose? I want to feel valued. I want to be noticed. I want to be seen. And God says, I see you, and I've given you a purpose, and it is to bring light to darkness and order to chaos. And there's a lot of darkness, and there's a lot of chaos. There's so much chaos right now, right? Oh, my goodness. Just go on social media for 2.5 seconds and you know how much chaos there is. Oh, Lord, help us. I just went to South Beach, Miami with my husband, thinking I'm going to get away and be in the sun. This will be great. And I got there and, oh, man, that place, it just felt so spiritually dark. You could just feel it. And I'm like, I just want to go home. Well, I just, you know how bad it was because I just wanted to come home to freezing cold Michigan. But God is like, Janelle, you, you carry the presence. He dwells within me. And I have a purpose to bring light to darkness. So go bring that light even in South Beach, Miami. And so I just began praying, and I just, I blasted, I wish I had my Bluetooth speaker, but I blasted my phone as loud as I could on the beach with that, you know, praise and worship music to counter all the rap. <laughs> rap is fine, but it was not good rap. Ooh. But you guys, we have the spirit within us, and we get to go bring dominion and light to the darkness. And it sets our hearts free because he has equipped you 
My friend recently just posted on social media. I said, can I steal that? She said, yeah. She said, if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, wherever you are, he's equipped and strengthened you for obedience and discipleship. So you have the Spirit within you. So you're equipped for obedience and discipleship. So every time I'm feeling like I'm a failure, every time my life is just so mundane and boring and I'm folding laundry and the socks aren't matching again and again and my kids are screaming and, you know, whatever it is in your workplace and things aren't, aren't going great and you just feel like, ah, oh, what's my purpose? You can remember your purpose is found in being obedient to the king. And you can just trust that, you know what, maybe this doesn't seem very exciting. Maybe it doesn't feel like I'm bringing order to chaos and light to darkness. But I know as I'm being obedient to the king that God is using this moment. So I'm just going to keep pursuing him and being obedient to whatever he's called me to. And I know that he is using it for his glory and for my joy. That sets our hearts free. Our purpose is found in obedience to him. And this brings us to our last kingdom theme of dynasty. We define dynasty as the crowning achievement of God's creation is a people that will reign and rule with God as his representatives on earth. We get to reign and rule with God as his representatives on earth. That is astounding to me. We are part of the kingdom. Romans 8 says we are co-heirs with Christ. With Christ, we are co-heirs with the Son of God. We rule and reign currently as we take dominion, and we're going to rule and reign with him forever. See, this truth should set our hearts free because every trial, every hard thing, all the suffering, it is light and momentary. And I know it doesn't feel that way right now. I get that. It doesn't always feel that way because we're in the already not yet. We're, we're going to have trials. We're going to have suffering. But because we're part of this dynasty, we know that God is using it all to make us more like him so that we can go and bring dominion and bring order to the chaos. Or, yeah, order to the chaos and light to the darkness. One day, we're not going to have any suffering, any tears, any hurting. Revelation 21, 3 through 5 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Amen. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. <laughs> He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. To write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. One day we will be in the fullness of the kingdom of God, in the presence of King Jesus forever and ever, and every day is going to be better than the last. All the hurt, the pain, the suffering, it'll disappear when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we'd first begun. It's just going to be so amazing. But for now, the kingdom of God covers the earth as people bow to the king. See, we make the invisible kingdom visible as we bow to the king. That's how the kingdom is made manifest in this world right now, as believers bow to the king. So let us dwell with our creator God. Let us dwell with him. Let us take dominion by bringing order to chaos and light to darkness as we just live in allegiance to him, knowing that we are part of a dynasty that lasts forever. 
in the final scene of the Bible, we are brought back to the garden. But it's more glorious. It's not just a garden. It's a city, and it covers the whole world. Oh, he is so good. Ladies, let us be women who dwell with him every day of our lives because the kingdom, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign. And he is the best king. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Would you just stand with me? Just put your arms out, hands out, and we're just going to pray. And then we're going to close in a song. God, I just thank you for who you are, that you are reestablishing your kingdom here on this earth, and that even though we mess it up, even though we choose other things, that you still choose to use us. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the truth that you are here with us, that you dwell with us, and that because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we have all that we need for the task of discipleship and obedience and surrender. Thank you that we get to take dominion and that as we take dominion, we will see lives changed, lives changed in our families, lives changed in our community, lives changed around the world. God, thank you. Somehow you choose to use us and you enable us and that is beyond what I can imagine. But I just pray, God, that this truth will just resonate into these women's hearts and minds this next nine weeks, Lord. And thank you, Jesus, that we get to be part of a dynasty that will last forever and ever and ever. And we will sing your praises for the rest of our days. God, we just give you all the glory and we love you. And we just pray that your name would be glorified here. Just start here in our hearts. Bring it home to our families, to our children, to our parents, to our grandparents. Spread it out into the schools, into this community. God, I just pray that Rockford would just be a place of revival that brings your kingdom and that it just goes out and that there's light to the darkness and that there's order to the chaos. We give you all the glory, King of kings, forever and ever you reign. In your beautiful name I pray, amen.